This episode of the Off Road Podcast is sponsored by Warren Power Tank and Medical Gear Outfitters. Off Road Podcast, episode 297, Off Road Cooking. Tonight, Jeremy does a little spring cleaning, Aaron does nothing, Koi is average, and Ben has some new headlights. We tell you Welcome to the Off-Road Podcast, the podcast about everything off-road. We cover the news, review products, and interview people in the off-road industry. I'm your host, Ben, and I'm here with my co-hosts, Jeremy, Aaron, and Coy. And welcome to the show. So, guys... The Weekend Review is brought to you by Medical Gear Outfitters. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting to have a casualty on the trail? Check out MedicalGearOutfitters.com to get straightened out. Medical Gear Outfitters has everything you need, whether you're going out for the day or traveling on a year-long expedition. Head over there to get off-road specific kits that meet all of your needs. And while you're there, make sure you use Off-Road Podcast for 10% off. I just uh, talked last week about getting that uh, new tourniquet and uh, bought one. Kept forgetting to do it, but I bought it over the weekend. So it shipped out today to me. Um, new soft tea tourniquet that uh, they're selling over there. Nice. Yeah. I'll be pretty excited to see that thing when, it, when you get it. Yeah, it's going to go in my battle belt with my IFAC. Aren't you operator? I am so operator, <laughs> especially since I bought it in tan to match my battle belt. Ooh. Ooh. Hey, man, Cancel. you should have gone with uh, black camo. That's that's where the cool kids were six months ago. I saw that black camo and it looks pretty hot, but it doesn't match. Um, it doesn't match what we're going for out here. And I like to sleep at night rather than operate at night. So Co- Coyote Browns. So 2020. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. Well, Aaron, what have you been up to? Um, dirt work was supposed to start today on my shop, but it sounds like it's going to be Tuesday at the soonest, probably Wednesday. Um, that's all right. It's still ahead of, I mean, we're way behind schedule, but it's ahead of schedule for when the pole barn parts are supposed to show up. So it's getting done. Uh, Saturday, I went out in the woods and did some fun airsoft goofing around. Um, it's a good time doing some, just some different fun drills and stuff with airsoft stuff. You don't just get to do normally and, uh, still waiting on some Titan swap parts, some stuff that I've bought from places that, uh, can't seem to, uh, tell me when it's going to ship. Um, I, I know how you feel, Jeremy, except <laughs> I really don't need these parts yet. Cause I can't start my Titan swap without, with them, but, uh, um, Still, you know, still bummed. Still, still don't have them. That that's been the industry right now. Like just getting parts is such a pain. I've had customers that wait like four months for their coilovers. Yeah, um, I had a guy where shipping had stuff in Portland, and he got mad and yelled at me. Um, and I I almost yelled back at him, but I was kind. I almost said bad words. So, so I know, but like I'm just not even. They're not responding to emails oh. until I send them. I have to send them three emails in a row for them to respond to me one time. Yeah. And none of their emails answer any of the questions that I ask. And so I have to send like three more emails and then they still don't. Yeah, it's uh, it's frustrating. So. That it is. I can attest to that. Yeah. Well, um, let's ju- let's jump over to Jeremy then. What do you uh, got going on? Uh, well, I took my battery in uh, to get warranted, so uh, it was dead. Kind of when I, when I, I left, I left it in and uh, left something running and kind of killed it. Which it's a deep cycle, which shouldn't have been a problem. Uh, are you sure? Are you sure it wasn't from when you started the fire that killed no, it? No, it wasn't. It wasn't from starting the fire. So then okay. I, I, about a month ago, uh, I took it in and and got them to charge it and make sure that it was good because i knew that was going to be the next step if i needed to warranty it uh that i would have to have them do that so uh, i took it in had them charge it had them test it the next day they said it was all good i took it home sat on my workbench and watched the voltage drop uh precipitously 
Uh, <laughs> and so a month a month went by, and I took it back to them and said, "Hey, uh, this is dead again, or it's not. It wasn't dead, but you know, it's been dropping in voltage. It's just been sitting on my workbench. I've been watching it drop voltage." And uh, they said, "Okay, let's take a look at it." And they said, "Yeah, it's about sixty percent charge now." So, and at first the guy was like. Yeah, you know, batteries lose voltage. And it's like, yes, I know, but you can't just sit there and, and track it over a few days watching it go, you know, yeah. almost <laughs> three quarters of a volt down. What uh, like, brand of battery? It's an Optima. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, yeah, I guess that is a little quick. <laughs> so he, they warranted it at that point. Um, and so uh, I got a new battery just waiting to go in. Uh, and along with that, I did a little bit of cleaning up of some wiring uh got things groomed so they're they fit a little bit better in the jeep and uh you know uh take multiple wires and put them into the same wire loom that type of thing um i'm just waiting for the battery to go back in uh to do the final groom on the uh terminal side so uh getting all the terminal wires to go in the proper orientation i want to get them into the i want to get them onto the uh onto the battery posts before i make the final touch-ups on that so that's been my week still mac waiting on axles to, to ship mac wants to know how long does it take to get axles he's asking here in the comments oh uh, too long let's see i ordered them <laughs> in i ordered them in the beginning of november and it is now the end of march so that tells you uh they were supposed to ship today that was probably my third or fourth uh estimated shipping date so that's now coming past Yay. Fun. Are they giving you tracking? Well, I mean, they they haven't shipped yet, so. Well, I oh. mean, you can create a label and give someone a tracking label. Uh, I guess. I don't know. I mean, it's freight, so I don't know if you can oh, yeah. quite do it that way. Is it, I don't know if the company do will do it the same UPS way. UPS freight or? I have no idea. Oh, okay. It was free freight, whatever free freight they gave me. Whatever the cheapest bidder is. So I'm I'm getting pretty annoyed. It's, com uh, it's coming on a rickshaw. Yeah. <laughs> Time to track isn't uh isn't responding to me anymore. Uh yeah. And even Northridge is having a hard time getting a hold of them now. Oof. So And they're a big company, so I mean that, that really does say mm -hmm. something when they're that they're probably getting inundated with people going Probably hey, man, where's yeah. my crap? Yeah, they're they probably just yeah. can't keep up. I wanted this um, three yeah. years ago, please. But it's annoying when you, you know, pay that much money up front. That's and then you have to wait for, you know, six months to get axles to ship. It's not so good. Yeah, you, you literally could have created life, found out its gender gender, and then probably be fit wrapping up your Lamaze class right now. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, I mean it makes me Do you have something that you want to tell us, Koi? <laughs> food baby <laughs> i i keep looking at uh northridge and seeing that they have the ultimate dana 60s in stock and i keep going ah huh, maybe i should have just ordered those but i mean they didn't have quite the gear ratio that i wanted and uh there was a couple of reasons that i chose the dynatrax over the dana 60s so yeah um, it's just it, it's looking nice that i could have had them installed already yeah, it does sound like a suppressor, Mac. That is 100% true. <laughs> well, if you would have if you would have formed one your axles, you would have had them a lot sooner. I don't know about a lot sooner because I, I would have well, done it on I, our trust, so Oh, that's true. Still, still quicker. <laughs> well, tip a typical form one typical form one would be a lot quicker and you'd uh um you, but that means you'd be building the axles yourself. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, I want to say the last time I saw form runs were like a month. So, uh, I'm joined a group on Facebook by accident um, for form <laughs> one people. Um, accident. And uh, well, I clicked on. It, I was like, oh, I'll join this group. And then it, they like had this list of questions, and they were super technical. I'm like, I don't want to answer these questions to join the group. So I just hit exit. And yeah, like I've, a half an hour later, said I joined the group. <laughs> yeah, I've had that happen before too. So, they're just but so somebody just said they had theirs in twenty-two days. Was one post I saw today? Twenty-two days. 
Yeah. That's fast. That is fast. Yep. Well, Koi, what do you got going on? I I haven't been up to a ton. I did that Champagne Creek off-road challenge we talked to talked about. We ended up getting fifth out of ten people. So I'm just oh, not average. out of three. I super I put the three in there. There was there was twelve people that originally signed up, but two dropped the like day of. Actually, a friend, you're one of your friends of the show, the uh, Adam from the Off Road Recovery Group. I think it was his team had some problems or something, and, and they canceled hmm. last day. I didn't know the other team. And what, yeah, um, so, what vehicle did you use for that? Uh, not mine. <laughs> it was a <laughs> uh, full size Bronco on 37s. That's uh, decent, you know, decently built. It's not really lifted very much, but OJ you know, Bronco. Uh, like right before the OJ Bronco, like it's like a late eighties. So it's OG Bronco. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not quite OG. No, it's. And not. then the the other vehicle was a '89 Toyota Extra Cab on 39s. Nice. It was fun. It was I had a ton of fun. Wished I would have changed a little strategy stuff. I think we could have picked up a place or two, but we uh, mm. all our decisions weren't perfect. So. But all, all in all, it went yeah. well. I, I'm glad how it went. Plenty of time for next time, That's right? Fun. Yeah. I, I hope you guys Did are you get there. A blue ribbon? Did you get a blue ribbon for participating? or You know, I would say that our team, while we didn't win or place, actually won the most because one of the guys on our team won the winch raffle. So what would you rather have, a three-foot-tall trophy or a brand-new worn winch, winch for free? Winch. You know? so, you know, there were several yeah. people offering to trade us trophies for winch. That speaks, I think. No, you yeah. just heard them. They said winch. <laughs> oh, uh, I didn't bring any of those. Uh, there may have been a few there, though. Yeah. And then I made a boo boo on the car I bought like two months ago. And since the DMV, yeah, in Oregon, anyways, you have to set up an appointment now because of covid so i had to drive to seattle i so, wanted to hang out with ben but he was at work so why didn't you come in literally right outside of my job why didn't you just come in and say hi you were at work you i'm not gonna come in while you're working uh, it was it was a day that i wasn't even supposed to be there so you could have came in and i well, you should have said that you're like i'm at work and i'm like shucks so i, I just took a stop by so i, I took a I'm picture a, you you're a jerk you're not my friend anymore. <laughs> we'll see. I don't know if if you stay in that uh, if you stay in that part of town too long, you might pick up an STD or something. I don't. And know. actually, I, looking at that picture, you might have shown up after I left. Yeah. Oh, my car's not there, so I had already left. So well, you didn't we, see your your forerunner, so. Well, no, I've been driving, driving the, the Camry. I know. No, I. Uh, that was a crazy <laughs> busy day. I had to uh, take a car. Um, we got a contract with the dealership and like first I, I went to work an hour early to get it to um, the alignment shop to then get it to um, immediately to the dealership and then deal with people yelling at me because their stuff's not here yet. Hey, uh, Mac has a really good comment here um, that being at work is different than working. And I 100 percent agree. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> I actually work with some guys like that. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. They, yeah. They are there technically. Yeah. Well, when they're, I'm, they're at work. Yeah. When I'm up front, I'm at work because, I, you know, I'm selling stuff. It's really easy to do. When yeah. I'm working, I'm generally in the back wrenching. Frenching? <laughs> wrenching. With oh, wrenching. Wenching. Winching, yes. With so, Aaron, Aaron, you might be able to uh, to uh, to relate to this. So, my shop teacher in high school was isn't a journeyman electrician, and he had a buddy who would do everything he could to look like he was working, uh, but not actually working. And he used to call it "hide to go seek for a grand a week." <laughs> nice. <laughs> you have to be part of a big shop and. Um on a big job i would assume to be able to not accomplish anything yeah or very so, little 
apparently he used to stand on a ladder where his uh, lower half was below the false ceiling, false overhead, and yeah. read a book. Oh my goodness, that's excellent. Oh man. Well, what have you been up to, Ben? Mm, not a ton. I've been working a lot. Outside of that, I got my headlights installed, but then the weather turned to crap. And so I haven't been able, I got like my new brake pads installed. I got those EBC orange stuff brakes that I talked about a couple months ago. Orange stuff, do they do they have like pumice in them? Like when you wash your no, hands? No, so they have, um, they have like four or five different levels. So like green stuff, yellow stuff. Red stuff Red is like stuff, he- yeah. their heavy duty towing ones. Well, their orange stuff is their off road ones. They have Doesn't black the stuff? orange stuff smell really good when you overheat them too? <laughs> no, <laughs> it cool. smells like citrus. <laughs> it's like a Cincy for your break. <laughs> so I got those. Um, like I said, stupid expensive, but I figured I'd give them a try, see if they're actually worth it. Um, and then I still have three brake lines to install, and I still got to put my driver's side tire back on. I just haven't had time, I, and the weather's been crap, and I don't want to sit outside in the driveway in the rain. I thought you put all your brake lines on, so you only put that one corner so on? So I only got that one on, and then I went to put the brake caliper on, and they had given me the wrong brake caliper. So I had to turn around and stop what I was doing, go to freaking... Uh, <laughs> the reason Aaron's laughing is because I posted in the chat uh who thought he was gonna say it started raining and his headlights filled up with water and we were all raising our hand. Oh my goodness, that would have been terrible. Uh but yeah. no, so I got new headlights on. Um those came in the mail and I like installed them immediately. I uh put uh LEDs in all of them. Anti ditch brakes. Let's see if they work. <laughs> The chat's on point tonight. <laughs> yes, it is. The chat I'm is on fire. Lit up. I'm lit up. Um, outside of that, I bought some uh, hefty, or was it uh, Husky? Yes, Husky. Um, they came, uh, Home Depot came out with some new um, tubs. Hmm. They're, um, they're red. They've got two, a 12-gallon and a 20-gallon. They're both the same size, one shallower than the other. And we went out and bought some, and we're organizing all of our camp gear um, so that we can keep our organi- our gear organized. They've also got a gasket around the inside, so they're watertight, dust tight at least. I'd say weather tight, probably yeah, not water yeah. tight. Yeah, they're probably more weather tight than anything. But I mean, it's good enough for the camp gear. I can throw it in the back of the trailer and not have to worry about it, or the Forerunner, possibly on top of the Forerunner if I need that space. I don't have the rooftop tent up there. So yeah. This easy light week. Hey guys, we're looking to reach more listeners. We're going to start reading Apple iTunes reviews on air. If you hear yours, send us a message with your address and we'll send you an off-road podcast sticker. You can find all of our social media by just searching our name. Now go hit that subscribe button. We also want to thank our sponsor, Patriot Patch. Head over to patriotpatch.co and check out their great selection of patches, shirts, cleaning mats, stickers, and signs. You can also join the Patch of the Month Club for 15 bucks and receive a patch matching sticker and artist proof each month. This month uh, is still the My Little Armalite. Share it on the screen there. Yeah, and then... Uh, Last week we mentioned their their limited run of Space Force was uh, drop three of four. This is the last one, drop four of four. And I really have no idea what this one is. It's blurred out really well. I I asked Jake um, if it Trek. was the, yeah, if it was a Star Trek USS Enterprise with a sombrero on, and he said no. So, so with that, that orange and blue, uh, it makes me think of a Nerf gun. Yeah, but from there, I yeah, I, I just don't know. I it's got to be the USS it. Enterprise. I just don't know what's on it. Maybe it's uh the Enterprise turned into a helicopter. I don't. Yeah, know. I thought it was yeah. a uh, uh, was it the Osprey uh vertical takeoff plane thing? With oh, two, it, that's, that's oh. what I was thinking. 
it could be Osprey. That makes a little more sense than the USS Enterprise because I would think they're using um, U.S. military vehicles. So it could I mean, be Osprey. It, it could be an Osprey mixed with the Enterprise. Mm-hmm. Ah, there you go. That could be. I'm feeling that. That's teamwork right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've just debunked See, you, it. You guys throw out the uh, the ideas, and I just put them together. Sounds like an engineer. Or a project manager. Yep. <laughs> the news is brought to you by Power Tank, the ultimate mobile onboard air system for performance, versatility, and reliability. They are your source for all air-related accessories. Check them out at powertank.com. Well, this week's episode, uh, if you haven't already heard, uh, Easter Jeep Safari is on. Uh, currently, uh, it's running through the 4th. Uh, if you're in the area, I mean, you pretty much have, probably have to be listening to this live or listen to it this week to even catch it, even if you're in the area. But, you know, head on out there. Um, but Jeep has been... Uh, announcing some new concept vehicles out at Easter Jeep Safari, and one of them is an all-electric concept car. So they t- termed it the uh, Wrangler Magneto. Uh, I like that name, by the way. I do, too. Yeah, I hope yep. they keep yeah. that if they if they actually bring this one to production. But what they didn't, didn't do with... So most uh, electric vehicles have, like, motors at either both axles or some have a motor for every single uh, tire. Um, They did not do that. So what they did is they actually replaced uh, the gas engine with an electric vehicle and saved uh, the normal drivetrain of the Wrangler. Um, Hmm. So it's got a two-speed transfer case and a six-speed manual. uh, This sounds sounds really familiar, almost like we interviewed a guy last week who did the exact same thing (laughs) to a forerunner. Yeah, almost like that. I wonder if they got the uh, idea there. Um, I think they stole it. I'm, no, I'm 100 percent think they stole it. <laughs> I think they should. Uh, they should sue. Uh, so they kind of designed, which this is the part where I think they really failed. Uh, they designed it to have the same torque and horsepower as the Pentastar. I'm sure they did it because that's what the drivetrain was tested on. But I mean, if you're going to go on an all electric vehicle, like give it some real torque, man. Right? Yeah, that's um, pathetic. 273 foot pounds is just not very much. Although, I mean, honestly, it's what they have in the, it's the, it's the regular regular motor. So it's, it's plenty for that. But like you say, let's do something with it. it. Yeah. If you're going to do it, do it right. Um, Which I think this is a great start. Uh, I'd love to see some all electric, uh, some all electric Wranglers come out and, that's just having an option. I don't think it's going to replace everything, especially not anytime soon. But, you know, it's it's nice to have that option out there. And uh, I like that they that they didn't go all fancy with the uh, with the drivetrain and put a motor at each each tire, making it hard to, you know, adapt the current aftermarket parts to the to the new uh, new version. So I'm happy that they did did it the way they did. There was a lot of people that that didn't like that, but heck i'm all for it yeah yeah i mean we kind of discussed that at the very end of last week's episode that uh there's all there's always going to be naysayers um but the market's moving that way we we definitely hate to lose internal combustion uh because it's fun it's loud it's rowdy it has a certain smell to it that brings back memories koi has got his eyes closed right now i know he's thinking of a certain time that he did a big burnout or something with a gas motor <laughs> so i was got, thinking the time i was at the drag drag strip and they had jet cars and for some reason behind the jet cars when they're they don't so really close that off so i just got as close as i could and just stood back there to you know withstand all the wind and stuff but it was the care like the raw kerosene was like burning my eyes nice <laughs> i saw one one time where they hung a turkey behind it and cooked a turkey Whew. My six-year-old loves the f- smell of exhaust. And I'm like, oh, yeah, don't stick your head down there for too long. Just like that that gas smell. He's like, oh, dad, that smells good. I'm like, yeah, don't Wait, sniff too much of that, so please. He sticks his head in front of it? Like, no, he sticks his no. head down there? He'll he'll be like sitting next to the forerunner and he'll smell the exhaust and he's like, I love the smell of gas, Dad. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to edit this out of the podcast so that child protective services doesn't get called on Ben. <laughs> 
You got their number? Yeah. I hope <laughs> it up in the chat. I actually just heard today that a dude jumped into an elephant enclosure with his two-year-old to take a selfie. <sighs> I uh, saw um, that. Oh, my goodness. I'm simultaneously blown away, but also jet like my dad wouldn't jump into an elephant enclosure with me to get a selfie. Like, you know how much that dad is willing? That's like some dad shipping right there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, Ben, what region are you in? I just want to make sure I post the right number. California. <laughs> <sighs> well, we got this next story about the Toyota Trail Hunter. Yeah. Um, so, what do you know about that? Yeah, yeah I, take so it. it's it's so Toyota has uh, um, saved the name. I, I don't know exactly how they what they call that. Uh, patent. They patent trademark name trademark. trademark. Uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Trademarked the the name uh, Trail Hunter. Um, though the inclusion of the word Trail Hunter does Trail does not always really relate to off road prowess. Um, <laughs> trailblazer um but some are hoping they're going to bring like some variant of the fj maybe in a newer style um so it's kind of up in the air but it's kind of cool um trd may, maybe it'll be another uh branding or model versus like the trd off-road but do a uh a trail hunter edition who knows uh, do the boys over at the horsepower hour or boost booze and barbecue know anything about this you got any insight i i know nothing about it honestly i, I wish i knew more i i hate to get too <laughs> i'm a toyota kind of a toyota guy obviously but i hate to get too excited because toyota likes to pull fast ones like put subaru engines in their sports car or just hire dmw <laughs> to make one and then call it some iconic sports car that everybody's been waiting on them to remake forever and uh trail hunter uh toyota likes to really just just pull it away from me right there you know so plus i mean talk about a douchey name trail hunter it sounds like what trail they name, hunter. it sounds like what they name some of the like the japanese k cars and stuff like that they've got the the, the silly names for things i can't think of any off the top of my head but maybe like or maybe they'd be like the Chinese cars, like the Super Love Joy or something like that. <laughs> it's like the name of a car in Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. You, you it's know, it's true. Actually, that'd be a pretty sweet off road rig in Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. I, I just had a thought. Maybe they're going to do uh, trail rated badges, but they're trail hunter badges on the sides of their vehicle. That would be hilarious. I, 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 I like that, hunting, but hunting down trails. Yeah, I don't know. And also, if they do come out with some new off-road trail hunter thing, uh, FJ Cruisers having the number one resale value of any vehicle in America, probably going to tank. And I'm not yeah. cool with that. So, Well, <laughs> oh, dude, it's crazy. You, like like a, a 10-year-old or was it 10, 15-year-old um, FJ Cruiser now, you can still get like 30 grand for them. I saw one listed for 30. I was just like, what type of crack are you smoking? Are you planning on selling yours anytime soon, Koi? Or I thought you were hanging on till till it falls apart, like Ben's. That's that's <laughs> well, two hundred thousand is kind of my number on 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 vehicles. Once we get up to a two in front of it, uh, it's time to let it go. No, that out just back. Okay. Okay. What? That, that's just broken in for a Toyota. Or time for the V eight swap at that time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, if you're making a race truck out of or something, whatever, but. Yeah, for me, because I go so far out and kind of weird places, I'm worried that like a brake line would fail or something in the middle of nowhere, and then I'd just be like stranded. <laughs> no, you can drive without brakes. Trust me, I know this. Turn, turns out it was a caliper. <laughs> Still, you can drive without brakes. Trust me, I know this. Not that you should drive without brakes. Yeah, that is true. That is true. If you have partial brakes, you know, like four pumps, you stop. You know, that's four still pumps. not the best. Four I, pumps, I do half a pint. Speaking of the trail hunter thing, I do remember an article I read a while back that they're going to make a smaller land cruiser that's cheaper for the American market. They were talking about. I yeah. wonder if maybe something like that's going to go on. Well, and they also have what, what was it, the TJ Cruiser? 
um, that never went into a di- um, being game? made. They that was like it, a Honda element, though. Yeah. So it's hard to say. There is a uh, the Trail Hunter is a YouTube channel. Yeah. Oh, Ugh. I hate that name. <laughs> I know I do too. Go prepared with Warren Industries. They produced the first recreational winch in 1959 and lead the industry with their dedication to quality and reliability. When you dig yourself in deep, make sure you have the right tools to get yourself out. Get Warren equipped and go where others can't. Now, let's get ready for adventure and head into our main topic. Well, this week, guys, we are talking about cooking on the trail. So... I know that's something that's kind of near and dear to my heart, so I'm pretty excited about this. And I know, yeah. uh, yeah. So I figured we'd start off talking uh, just about kind of some cooking methods. uh, And by methods, this is really the uh, type of uh, cooking device. I was going to say stoves, but they're not all stoves. So... uh, I, I guess the first one we'll talk about here is uh, it's just a backpacking stove. So this is something that's really ideal for just kind of one one person. Uh, if you're boiling water just for coffee, um, you might want to use this meth use this type of stove if uh, if you're worried about weight with your vehicle or storage. Um, and it's great if you're eating nothing but freeze dried meals. Uh, if you just have to boil water, but Man, if you try to cook on, actually cook something on it, it can be very, very unstable. Uh, you kind of have a small cooking surface, and obviously there's only one burner. Um, but you definitely, uh, what it lacks in, in ability to make gourmet meals, it definitely makes up for in its portability and how light it is. And they're usually pretty quick to set up as well. Usually yeah, my, yeah. just screwing right onto a fuel canister. Yeah, my, my jet boil full... Um like the the fuel canister goes right into the cook the water boiling portion and all that all packs down into a nice compact package and it only takes like 60 seconds to boil the water it's pretty quick yeah especially when you only use a centimeter of water to to uh say that it only takes 60 seconds yeah i have a msr reactor and it's you know all it all russian dolls together and uh, that it's that particular model is windproof or as windproof as these kind of stoves can get. The only downside to most all of the backpack stoves, your heat control, it's it's all or nothing. It's a light switch. You So it's really tough to actually cook food because it's searing it or it's not getting any heat. <laughs> yeah, which is why they're very good for boiling water. They are superior at boiling water. It's incredible how fast yeah. mine will boil a pint of water. Well, I mean, I I don't know about you guys, but when I was doing a lot of backpacking, that's pretty much all you're doing is just boiling water to make freeze dried mm-hmm. meals. Yeah. Or coffee. Or coffee. coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So uh moving on to the next uh the next one. So we kind of have just a single burner, so we're not gonna go into fuel types because that's what we're doing next. But uh pro to this is it's definitely more stable than the backpack stove. Um, you're still a little bit limited on cooking surface. Uh, you're still kind of just have that, obviously have that one burner. So you can't have, uh, you know, you can't have a steak going in a pan and have some rice pilaf going in the pot on the other one. Um, but you know what it, what it, uh, lacks for the surface, at least you're generally going to be a little bit smaller. And, uh, depending on the stove, as Koi was talking about, you can, either have one that's pretty much an on and off light switch, or you can have one with almost infinite uh, levels of of adjustment. It just kind of depends on the manufacturer of the stove at that point. Yeah. You get, you just get a little bit more uh, adjustability than you do with the, uh, the backpacker stove. Obviously it takes up a little more space, but this is what I take when I go out by myself rather than dragging the Coleman two burner stove. Cause I'm usually cooking, not much so it's not a big deal i'm not uh not doing a lot of work there so one burner is just fine 
and a lot of people I know kind of they will uh, pair up the you know backpacking stove and the single burner because uh, they want to make coffee water at the same time as they're cooking their breakfast type of thing. So you can do these. Obviously, you can combine any of these uh, cooking methods into mm. uh, into your your setup. It's really gonna uh, depend on what really works for you. Yeah, and how much you want to bring. That is also true. So uh, moving on to the next one, uh, obviously the uh, standard progression is going to be from a single burner to a double burner. So you get a much... classic. <laughs> that is classic. That's probably what most people have, I would venture to guess. I don't or know. That's probably a bold statement. I don't know. Well, I've seen a lot of these partner all aluminum, super overlandy Swedish stoves nowadays. I feel like most people have probably started with this or have had one in their life at some point. If you're camping, this has somehow been a part of your life at some point. Oh God. I had that exact stove. It's awful. It it was I wouldn't say it was completely a light switch, but there was it was maybe a uh, three position light switch where <laughs> you could not yeah. cook very low. It was like you had medi you had off medium and on. Yeah, you had it's blown out by the wind, almost hot enough, and blacken everything. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I had one of these for a brief moment when I was like fifteen, and it was a a white gas one that I rigged into a flamethrower and immediately got taken away from it. <laughs> so, so this is this is what I take camping with me when I don't take my single one. <laughs> that exact stove. Yes, hundred percent. You're so so basic. <laughs> yeah, so I'm basic. Uh, we had this exact stove as well. Uh, and little story time here. So my wife and I actually found it when we were on Wobder one year, probably I think the year before we met you guys. Um, well, two of you guys, Koi's excluded in that. Um, so we we kind of just drove up to this campsite and it was sitting there on the fire pit and we're like. Well, that's weird. And it was nicer than the stove we were using. So we're like, well, we'll hang. I mean, we're hanging out here. So if somebody comes up to, to claim it, then we'll hand it right over. But hey, got to take the uh, trail trash out, right? That's it. Did you leave the, did you leave your old one there? <laughs> no, we did not. <laughs> Swap it out. <laughs> we took it home and goodwilled it. All right. I 100% All right. would have left my old one. But then you'd be contributing to trail trash. No, it'd just be equal. I would have changed nothing. <laughs> Could you imagine if you went back to find your stove and there was a junkier one in its place? <laughs> I was I was just thinking, could you imagine if uh, you're listening to this show and you hear about your stove that you left on Wobder? Well, contact us. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll probably send you, you know, I'll send you some money probably if you could tell me where it was. I actually once was part of a group of guys that got snagged a free couch from the side of the road, took it to a bonfire, and then we returned it later that night back to where the <laughs> I I was picturing you burned it and then brought it back, but now I understand what you're saying. Can you we imagine a, if you looked at looked out your window and you're like, oh thank goodness it's gone. And then you wake up the next morning and it's back. <laughs> no, they saw us loading it up and we pinned a note on it. And a dollar bill says, my girlfriend loved your couch. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, next, the next one here uh, is uh, where hashtag overland life starts. So without this, Woo! you are you are not a true overlander. I feel like Koi needs to talk about this one since he owns no less than two of these. Well. Yeah, a lot of you peasants don't use these very much, but they are superior. I actually have a love-hate with mine. I, I I didn't like it so much at first, but I've I've grown to like it because it actually packs down a little smaller than the like a Coleman two burner. It's actually pretty comparable in that. And I used a Camp Chef oven a long time before that, so it's actually packs a lot smaller than that. But the number one thing with scholars, you kind of have to plan your meals around this utensil. There's there's things that won't do, like cook pancakes. Uh, 
you can yeah. one. Will it cook one in the middle? I, I actually, I always meant to try, but it's like, uh, so I, I, I do love my throttle. If you're looking on the screen here, if you're watching live, I've got a picture of some eggs and sausage. I think we cooked one morning. Yeah. And the eggs, I mean, you see that big pool in the middle. It literally just pools up all in the middle. There's nothing you can do about it. And and it cooks it, like it's, the inner three inch ring. Yeah. Yeah. It's concave, so that's that's why it pools in the middle. It's a disc. So if you if you plan like I make a lot of like breakfast scrambles, eggs, you know, with bacon and stuff. You plan things, stir fries, taco, meat, like great at that stuff. So if you're doing that kind of stuff, great. If you're trying to do a lot of other things, not so good. I've I've talked to guys that claim they've baked bread in it and they they get super fancy. I, it's really hard to do a lot of the other stuff and really not worth it to me. But it's mm. and they're also very easy to clean. You don't have to pack uh cookware so you don't need a skillet you don't need pans you don't need a griddle this is all of that and you could just serve right out of it put it away so over wheel bound says that the scottle just isn't big enough and doesn't have enough hot surface i've got a southwest disc discata with a burner that has also a handle a 32 quart pot cook for the whole crew if i want to so we'll have to google that discata see how it's slightly different that must be quite a bit bigger because i just have a standard timbo tusk scottle you can do two dozen eggs but it's kind of you're gonna lose some eggs stirring it but a dozen half eggs no problem so i'm i'm looking at the discata and it's instead of being concave it's a little more flatter um it's a fire disc damn it i hmm. uh the the fire disc one i've looked at and it is super flat but it doesn't pack down near as well the feet are yeah they stay large they don't come in three pieces they're just two legs that make four legs but like they two legs are each one individual thing so they they don't pack down very small yeah, so so the discata looks like it's kind of a, um, like a walk, more of a walk than a, because it's got a flat, it, the the disc portion isn't stuck to it, so you can pull it off. Uh, Timbo Tusk also makes a like mini one. Can't remember what they call it now, but it's literally like medium dinner plate sized for like motorcycle guys or something. I actually <laughs> own one. I've literally never used it for motorcycle guys. I don't think I, I'd ever take that on a motorcycle trip. I don't know, but it's not, it's too heavy. I don't know who uses it, to be honest. It's, I want it. So it's like, okay. I don't know what you use it for. This Discata company has um, pages of different size discs, different styles. Some are flat with a rim. Um some are small, some are like 24 inches in diameter. It says it weighs 26 pounds. Can you imagine packing that around? <laughs> yeah. You know, the yeah. other thing about throttles is they're actually pretty easy to make if you want to make your own. They're expensive to buy, but you can make one with your own stuff for like 60 bucks. Yeah, the yeah. one we've used that's uh, Rick's is one he made, and it's awesome. Yeah, they're if you you live near a tractor supply store, it's literally a cultivator disc. So, yep. And in Rick's case, some horseshoes, which is the one that's on the screen right now, is actually Rick's that he made. Yep. Well, uh, the next one is uh, we're going to talk about some some oven action here. So. Um, everything we've talked about before is like a cooking surface. Now we're going to talk about some ovens. Have you guys ever used one of these before? The foldable Coleman ovens? I cannot say that I have. No, I haven't. Koi? I have had, I've had one for like six years and I've never used it. <laughs> <laughs> I got it in a garage sale because I thought it would be awesome. And I just, I literally have never used it. So I have one and my wife has used it because, well, I guess I used it to make pizza one time. Actually, it made really good DiGiorno pizza at the Overland Rally. 
Um, you have to cut the pizza really small. Like I had to cut a DiGiorno pizza into thirds to get it to fit in there to cook one third of it at each time. Um, but it was it was awesome having fresh hot pizza. Um, yeah, that was good. Uh, some of the cons with this uh, is that it's really hard to regulate the temperature. There's no insulation on the stove at all. It's just sheet aluminum. And everything I've read, people complain that the, the temperature gauge that's on the front of the door, that uh, they, they, do not, uh, they do not read right. And in fact, ours is, we, we brought along our oven thermometer, our standalone oven thermometer, and ours was like 40 degrees off. I can't remember if it was 40 degrees plus or 40 degrees minus, but it was 40 degrees off. So make sure you bring something to test your equipment and uh, check it out. But, but they do work. Um, my wife made biscuits in it one time when we were camping. We had biscuits and gravy using this bad boy. And she made a lot of biscuits because it was for a group camp out. And they turned out really good. You just have to be on top of it and monitor it. Unfortunately, every time you open that door to check on it because there's no window, you lose all that heat and have to start over. Didn't we do so. uh, biscuits and gravy when we went? Um, oh, no, that was with a different thing. Never mind. Oh, listen to you camping with other people. No, it was with us. Well, you were there, too. <laughs> No, oh. it was it, it was a different method. Different method, yeah. Um, the so I guess I didn't say this, but this for those who aren't watching live um, or on YouTube down the road, this sits on top of a propane stove. So it uses a propane burner, and it, in the picture it shows it on top of a Coleman propane stove, which we just talked about being um, really hard to regulate temperature. So imagine trying to cook with poor temperature regulation skills and an oven that doesn't hold heat. And uh, it, it just makes it tough. Double poor temperature regulation. Yeah. Exponentially. So the next one, uh, the next oven to talk about here is called the camp chef oven. And this is a pretty slick little device. Have you guys ever seen these before? It looks, huge. I, I own one. <laughs> you do. I, oh, cool. you need to bring it on the next trip then. Well, I, I actually, they're really sweet. The downside is, is just the physical size. It's the size of a small cooler. But yeah. I mean, the, the one I have, man, I've had it for years. It was when they first started making them and they're a lot better now, but yeah, it's amazing. I've cooked, it, it'll fit a nine by 13 pan. So you can make casseroles. Uh, I've brought pizza dough and just made fresh pizza in it. Uh, chicken pot pies if you like my wife will make a chicken pot pie and freeze it and then we'll bring them and then plus you have the two burners on the top so these these are incredible if you enjoy cooking while camping it's honestly it's i don't see how it can be beat it's primo but yeah the physical size that it takes in your vehicle is i mean it takes a lot of space and inside a vehicle they may you have to pack them with like paper towels and things because they rattle so bad <laughs> it will drive you insane. so it sounds like something great for a trailer yeah it would be good for a trailer i i mean jeremy you, you are kind of a a gourmet camp cook and i'm surprised you don't have one because this is the temperature control on the burners is amazing the oven is infinitely adjustable has a temperature gauge and i mine you have to kind of watch the gauge and adjust it i hear the new ones you just set to a temp and it auto kind of does it oh, itself nice. Fancy. I've, nice. I, haven't, I haven't checked on that but somebody told me that i mean if i had infinite space great i'd love it I, but i'm always trying to balance that space aspect i'm That's visualizing fair. on like a square drop or teardrop style trailer where it's got that front kitchen that pulls out and usually it's like a two burner stove or you pull out the fridge freezer you could have a pull out that has that bad boy on it. That'd be pretty sweet. That would be, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be a fresh homemade pie while you're camping. Like, and that's <laughs> the only thing that can really give you that experience. Like there, if you like to cook while you're camping, they, they can't be beat in my opinion. I bet I can do it in a Dutch oven. Yeah. Yeah. But this would do it like half the time without any of the, the pain. Like it's just easy. But and, I mean, I, I like and, and you don't have to wait a half an hour for it to cool before yeah. you can eat it that and then 
you don't get surprise burnt. Like it's not maybe if the if the pie is okay, we'll eat it. Like it's not that. It's just the pie will be done in forty three minutes and then we'll eat it. All right, cook. Well, off. let's let's talk about the Dutch oven then here real quick. Oh which yeah, is kind of biscuits and gravy. Yes. So I've made biscuits and gravy in this. Uh, that's I think my favorite thing to make in in my Dutch oven is biscuits. Uh, it's awesome because you can make some baked items. Uh, the biggest con is uh, it's heavy. It's heavy, and it's, it's time consuming. Bulky. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, I love them. Uh, you can do so many things in the Dutch oven that you never thought you could do while camping. So, I w- I would say the other con of these is it cooking in a Dutch oven is a skill set on its own. It's you don't just get a Dutch oven and then cook stuff in it. No, like you, you, have, you to have to learn. learn. How to, yeah, yeah. There's Absolutely. a there's a process where you the first set of biscuits you make the first time you make bread in it you will not eat it. You may eat the top or the bottom of those biscuits, but not all of them. We experienced that, right, Jeremy? No. Did we burn the first biscuit? No. They were, I mean, they were a little overbrowned, but not oh, burned okay. by any means. I thought you threw some away into the fire at one point, but I don't remember. That's because we didn't eat them. Okay. All right. That's yeah. why. Max says uh, fresh pie out of the oven and ice cream out of your ARB fridge. Oh, yeah. No, you can make your ice cream with a drill. Oh yeah. yeah, how does that actually, go? Let's, <laughs> that's a great segue. Uh, let's, let's share that picture. Where is that? It's here somewhere. Right here. There it is. <laughs> so that was our attempt at making ice cream while snow camping. Yeah, uh, like ice cream. It's it's a Ryobi drill with a cool, uh, cool a whisk whip. a whisk chucked into it. And we did this with no recipe, just had some cream and some sugar and some vanilla and some snow, which Lots obviously didn't get get it obviously did not get cold enough well um, while i salute your improvisation skills i still hold to that you guys are peasants <laughs> well yeah i mean we don't have an ice cream maker um but yeah so this as everybody's been alluding to uh we did not make ice cream that night what we really made was closer to cool whip yeah um it it could have been the ryobi drill we didn't have like a a quality tool like a Milwaukee or <laughs> DeWalt. <laughs> sure, let's yeah. go with that. It was it that. was still good. It was still it was actually a really fun activity that we did. Oh yeah, um, and a great story. I, yeah. Yep. Well, we will always remember the uh, the Cool Whip ice cream. Yes, and it was great with the root beer. And and now we invite Koi so he can bring his ice cream maker. Yep. Um, and so another method here is uh, manifold cooking, uh, good old manifold burritos there. Um, and you can, th- th- those are always interesting. Um, I've seen people use like a, a can of beans, but you've got to be careful. Otherwise you, you have got, you got an exploding to... can of beans in your engine yeah. bay. You got to You have to vent them. Um, I can't remember who it was that was talking to us that did that with their beans and it exploded and it like blasted some plastic coolant connection hose and uh, <laughs> yeah, drained all their that? coolant. I don't remember. That was a while ago. If you guys so, remember, yeah. write, write in, let us know. Yes. I, I have never had one explode in the engine bay, but I used to be like a manifold cooking savant at work on the work trucks. If you have a turbocharged vehicle, the turbo is a great spot to put it right up nice. there. And I would never vent them inside, but you kind of had to figure your timing out. And then I would always buy the pop top ones because opening with a can opener when it's super hot is bad. But I, I took it one time. I knew it was too hot. I had to actually get it with a pliers. I couldn't even use like gloves. It was just screaming hot. And then I stuck it in the cup holder of my work truck and then kind of took the pliers to pop it. And it was spaghetti and meatballs. And I just barely cracked it, and three quarters of the contents of the can shot straight up out of get to the room. It looked like somebody got <laughs> oh, Lord. head headshot inside the yeah, car. I literally know how they make that that arterial spray in movies. It was the overheated can of spaghettios. It just boosh, and then I spent like an hour cleaning spaghettios off the windshield. So it works really good. I I've ate a ton of food off manifold that way, but. You can easily you over say off of the windshield. <laughs> yeah, you, you have a squeegee. <laughs> it's, 
Yeah. Um, Overwheel Bound says that we hadn't mentioned the uh, exhaust system grill that we posted in the fan group. So yeah, that was a picture. I don't know how real it was or not. Um, I, I feel like it was, was real, I like you could buy it from Wish or something. I, I heard that that was a real patent and that was like the patent drawing, but it actually wasn't real. But that's something I heard online. Man, essentially it was a like a hamburger patty press that you use the exhaust to heat up the metal that it was in. The exhaust didn't go through the chamber that the meat was in, but it was right next to it. But I can't imagine having my food that close to exhaust, that close to the ground at the back of a vehicle. Yeah, Ben's yeah. kid would love it. Yes, there we go. <laughs> There's the picture. There's the picture. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I would try this. Like, if it works, that would be amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, there, there's a chance that it's not going to poison you. So It clearly shows a smoke path. Yes. I mean, not in this picture, but... <clears throat> um, you know, but how, you hit a bump and that clip's going to come open, your patty's <laughs> going to fall out. I mean, there's just... Hey, where's my burger? <laughs> yeah. We should get this for uh, other Aaron since he always eats hamburgers when we're out camping. And he always yeah. cooks for himself. Yep. Yeah. So uh, that, well, oh, we got mind. one more got here. One more, yeah. The barbecue, good old oh, yeah. classic barbecue, bulky and uh, but it smells good. Yeah, uh, I mean, you also, depending on your barbecue, you got to bring some fuel. So yep. yeah, generally uh, charcoal, generally yeah. charcoal. I had one that was a green propane can one. Hmm. They definitely oh, make some right. nice propane ones. And it does kind of, if you, you kind of have to plan your food around the fact that you have a barbecue. Obviously, if you want to cook an egg or something, it can be a little tough. <laughs> but they, they, once again, if you plan your food around the barbecue, you don't really have to bring all the skillets and all the cookware. You just need a spatula, and hamburger yeah. patties, and steak, and really whatnot. keep it simple that way. Yeah. And there's the bacon uh, exhaust uh, grill clothes. Yeah, I, that's a that's a no for me, dog. Oh, I figured you hard pipe that in. <laughs> <laughs> Climb under the vehicle and pop it open. Yeah, oh, the burger's done. Sure, why not? I want to. I want to see somebody have the, the exhaust hamburger cooker in there, and then they get to a hill climb. They're like, "Sorry, I got to take it out." So, have enough horsepower to make it up this yeah. hill climb. <laughs> I don't think it does I'm much sure to restrict the flow. Really. I, 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 I digress. Anyway. It's more like a muffler. Uh, so that kind of uh, ends our cooking methods segment. So moving on to the next segment is uh, fuel types. So the f first fuel type that we're going to talk about is uh, gas fuels. So the first one on the list is, uh, is propane. So uh, I think the biggest pro in, in propane's favor is uh, it's just so available. I mean, you can find it pretty much everywhere. Uh, it's pretty high efficiency. It's relatively clean. Uh, you can buy it in larger tanks. Um, so like you can get like a two and a half pound or a, or a 10 pound tank or uh, one of the one pound tanks, the little green ones. Um, it works pretty well in the cold. I mean, it, it's not going to, probably be your best bet if you're going to you know the arctic or something like that but you know for most people snow camping it works great uh it's pretty cost effective and it it doesn't ever go bad um the biggest con that we could come up with is uh the small bottles can go out pretty quick if you're not paying attention to them and it's hard to tell exactly how much fuel is left in those things yep propane and propane accessories are very awesome and you if wrote, you 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 wrote here that it works well in the cold, but at a certain temperature, it stops working in the cold. Yes. Yeah, and, and, it and you can with it on the ground. But they work better than butane in the cold is kind yes. of their thing. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the other downside I would throw out is, like it says, small bottles can go out quick, and then when you have four empties of these milk jug-ish sized green bottles that are trash, they take up a lot of space. Yes, you know, bringing that fuel and then it's it's still empty. It's physically the same size. So, yeah. 
And it seems to be a common trail trash that people leave too, which is something that irritates me. They just leave those green bottles at camp or they shoot them and leave them um, at my throw them in the fire. hidden, throw them in the fire. Yeah. At the hidden favorite campsite that I've shared with all you guys in one of the trees off in the distance there, the roots are exposed and there's about five or six of those tucked down underneath the roots in this tree. Someone left there. I guess I should have uh, been responsible for them and picked them out of there and thrown them away. The new, the uh, next fuel type is uh, butane. So butane definitely doesn't work well in the cold, um, but it definitely uh, is pretty easy to get a hold of. Um, and it's it, a lot of single burner stoves are butane stoves. Uh, I had one for a while and then I tried to take it snow camping and that does not work. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely not the best for snow camping. I've got a single burner uh, butane mm -hmm. stove and it uses a, uh, the, the fuel canisters like the size of a can of spray paint, um, which is yeah. really nice. I've also been hit with one of those that someone's thrown in a fire. Um, not, not the best. So, yeah. Yeah, the and kind of in the same family as the butane. It, I think it just uh, is a different bit of a different formulation. But there's the isobutane. So the isobutane is what most of the backpacking stoves use. Um, they're usually a lot more efficient in the cold and don't freeze up as you on you quite as easily. Um, but they're still not the best in the cold. Um, but they also uh, a lot of them have some proprietary blends. So. Some of the stoves will say that they'll only work with uh, their proprietary blend, which, you know, don't can't really say whether or not that's true. Um, there probably is you'll probably see some sort of efficiency uh, difference between using their fuel and using some other, but somebody else's fuel. But uh, and you really kind of have to go to kind of a sporting goods store to find those uh, most of your, you know, you're not going to just stumble upon that at a gas station. Um, you're no. really going to have to go out looking for it. Yeah, I, I've I've been able to find like uh, I've got a replacement one for my uh, jet boil through Walmart. So they're out there. You just got to look around, know where to go. They, they also are affected by elevation, Pro propane in as well, but not to the extent that butane is. So the higher elevation you get, they can stop working just from elevation, not necessarily cold. Yeah, also, there is a little trick. It's not really a little trick, but something I've done before snow camping with a butane stove, keep the stove in your sleep or not the stove, but the tank in your sleeping bag to keep it warm. Oh. You can at least, you know, cook a one meal like, or, you know, boil some water. If you just have it in your backpack sitting on the ground, you'll have a hard time getting anything to happen. Indeed. So uh, our next, our next, uh, branch here is going to be liquid fuels so uh aaron why don't you tell us about the first one uh first one's gasoline and i'm not sure where you use gasoline other than in one of the older coleman multi-fuel stoves um I, I feel like that's just about it unless you made your own uh little single burner out of the uh soda cans where people <laughs> where people um they cut the can in half and slide it together and poke all the little tiny holes in it. Um, I, I'm not sure really what you'd use gasoline for a positive for it is that it is available. Um, almost everybody on your trip probably has a Jerry can. If you're doing some overlanding stuff like that, you got the gasoline there. Um, you can pick it up anywhere as well. Although I'm not sure if you can go to the gas station and like grab the pump and like pump it into your Coleman stove. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how that works. Well, I don't think you're supposed to transport those loaded with fuel anyway. Oh, I've never owned I've never owned a multi fuel stove or a lantern for that metal, so I don't know. Uh, you, you and you could consider like a a, a man, cooking manifold. There, your fuel for that is gasoline. Ooh, deep pull, Ben. Deep, deep. <laughs> yeah, that that that's gasoline powered right there, unless it's a diesel. That's not really camp cooking, though. You're not really that and the exhaust burger. You're not really sitting at camp running your engine trying to heat up a single patty or cook some burritos at camp with your rig. So the next uh, fuel type here is what 
is probably the best liquid fuel. So it's white gas. So <laughs> oh, because it's white, it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> no i see so part you have to the, get canceled the, boy yes i am uh the reason it's called white gas is because there's very few impurities uh mm. and so some of the benefits of this <laughs> yes, 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 yes get You're your jokes making... out <laughs> jeremy needs uh, to get work yep i'm gonna get canceled uh, so some of the pros is it's not pressurized, so uh, you don't have to worry about a pressurized container. Uh, you can reuse the container just by filling it up. Uh, it's liquid, so you just literally pour it in. Uh, white gas is probably one of the most efficient fuels in colder environments. Um, <laughs> the main con is it requires pumping and priming. You can't just plug in, plug in the bottle and you have pressure. All right. Let's, uh, Ben, can you uh, blame yeah. it on the a a a a alcohol? I, 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 I can definitely blame it on the alcohol. Uh, so alcohol, um, we mentioned earlier the uh, little, like the soda pop cans, those alcohol stoves. Um, those are really popular in like the... Uh, prepper groups because they're really small like you can fit them in a backpack use some alcohol fuel uh, pretty readily available like using heat um rubbing alcohol um but it's very light stoves it's liquid um very slow um about half the energy to weight unit of propane a very sensitive to wind um, what's a weight unit wait uh, i don't know. that's how long it takes to heat up it's the weight <laughs> unit yeah, there we go. <laughs> have to wait for it. Uh, um, it's interesting. So it's it doesn't have good below freezing. So I don't know much about any liquid fuels for cooking. I'm this is I'm very green to this. So it's poor below freezing. Can you guys explain that to me at all? Uh, it's just because it's it's so uh, it doesn't have as high of a energy transfer. So uh, okay, as you it's it's not as hot as it's not as hot of a burning fuel. The BTUs really are so low, it's hard to yes. overcome the ambient temperature. Yes. Thank you. That was much better way of putting it. I sounded like an engineer there, huh? I know. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. that was cool. No, cool that now. was good. That, that was, was my good. one 30 seconds of smartness. <laughs> That's why we have you on. <laughs> Those little nuggets. <laughs> yeah. The well, last one here is kerosene. Um, it's another liquid, obviously, uh, it's affordable. You can buy it in a con. I mean, you 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 do buy it in a container already. You don't really buy it in bulk like you do gasoline. You can, like, if you live on a farm or something weird, but uh, you buy it in a container, so you can just use a container it comes in as what you take camping with you. Um, it's got more impurities than white gas, and it can actually clog a stove because of those impurities. So your uh, your stove has it's it's it doesn't just have little uh, um, it's got like filters and things in it. So <laughs> apparently, Jeremy's been canceled. Um, too too much white gas with Jeremy. Um, but yeah, the 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 kerosene has more impurities which can clog your stove it clog the filters or the little uh um orifices that the flame comes out i believe kerosene is also really efficient at altitude i know like diesel heaters are often used mm -hmm. in campers that spend a lot of time in high altitude and diesel cooktops which is easily easy to get a hold of yeah. This is going to be probably Aaron's favorite one is the next one. Some solid fuels. And this yes. is probably definitely Aaron's favorite one. Wood. 100%. Wood. 100%. Yep, wood. wood. Aaron loves Aaron, wood. Aaron does love wood. And uh, so, so I've got... this picture is uh, something that I did with Ben on one of our previous snow camp trips. And we made the Swedish fire block. It wasn't a Swedish fire log because this was a block of wood, not a log of wood. Um, and it uh, boiled water for sure with lots of fanfare flames and sparks and smoke. Yeah, it worked really good. 
and we uh when this last trip we went snow camping on um we did a swedish log and it worked really good too um the boys were sitting by it warming up their hands because they could get closer to it than they could the fire safely um and the only big problems with wood um i mean obviously you, you go in the woods it's all around you but uh big problems are fire restrictions slow you need to preheat it um like what from here what june about july to early september there's no burning you're on burn bands so no wood for you um and another issue is that you can't control the temperature you can't turn it up or down yep very easily so you have to hold your food closer or farther away to get the temperature you need I will say, though, that I have successfully hard-boiled an egg over a campfire. Nice. In a bucket of water? Or... Nope, I just put it on the grate, and I kept it a far enough distance away, so I guess it wasn't really boiled. It was just heated up enough. Cooked hard. Uh, another cons... You say cooked hard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's... Wow. You're really all... No. <laughs> really <laughs> hard. hard tonight. Yeah, cooked really hard cooked hard <laughs> there we go jeremy is officially canceled another consideration with wood is there are plenty of areas where you are not supposed to harvest wood from that area even if it's dead on the ground there are a lot of places that you you're supposed to leave it and then you also need to think about whether you're even allowed to bring your own wood especially if you're doing interstate travel they don't yep. want you to bring your own campfire wood. You could be bringing some beetle that's just going to decimate that area or something. But, puh, puh. What uh, if it's yeah, all manufactured wood products? Does that matter then? Uh, I would, I I would uh, think that you could, I think you could get away with if you were bringing um, lumber, kiln dried, lumber, kiln yeah. dried wood, the uh, termite treated wood. wood. Yeah. For sure. If it's in your house, they don't touch it. So, do you, any of you guys have uh, have experience with like the bio light stove? Yes, ish. So my my sister got it for me a few years ago, and I kind of just threw it into my uh, prepper supply because I don't I haven't used it for camping yet, but I need to get it out sometime just to give it a try. Did you have any good success with it? I don't own one. I have a friend that has one, and uh, so so the. The energy collection or whatever is mostly runs the little fan that yeah then makes it, but it is you got to get it. It takes like an hour before you have it going enough where you can charge your phone and you you can only put like pine cones and little sticks in it. So you basically just have an armload of stuff slowly like eating it. It's it would be easier to have like a bicycle powered charger to charge your phone by far. Well, it well, sounds like it sounds a very like needy. It, it's, yeah, it sounds like it'd be great for like a a tiny little shelter you'd make in the woods like if you're doing some like primitive camping um and you need to charge your phone and you well, need to charge or, your phone or you need a little bit of heat i mean yeah. i know like they sell it as a stove that you can actually cook on um yeah a bigger one they have a bigger one nowadays so the the biolite fire pit one that's i don't know two foot long foot wide that one is legit it's it'll I get your phone it, you can cook on it, but it's it's more of a fire pit. But the way the fans do this like circular motion, it is pretty much smokeless. And the outside is a screen so you can see the fire all the way around. It's they're really cool. 250 they're bucks. Expensive. Yeah, they're very 250 bucks. Cheap, but they're they're cool. It also they, uh, big. you can't get an Aaron sized fire in it. Mm -mm. They sell a cooking kit version also, which looks like it comes with a tray and a lid for 370 bucks and tongs comes with tongs also. Oh, well, if it does it come with a bag, if it doesn't come with a bag. I, I'm not buying it. It comes, <laughs> in, look. it comes in actually like three separate bags, not one. Probably it well, does. I just wanted a bag, so I'm not buying it. Well, our, our last one here is charcoal. Uh, I can hear H Hank Hill going, oh, no, Peggy, that's bad. <laughs> but uh, charcoal, I mean, that that's a great one. It's um, The only thing that really sucks with charcoal is it's uh, black. 
but you get consist consistent heat. <laughs> Oh, wow. What? <laughs> you better cancel yourself now. Yep, I, wow. I, I'm officially What? <laughs> what was that, Ben? What do uh, you mean? I, I, I mean, like, you get black soot all over your hands when you're you're grabbing yeah. it out of the bag and such. It is very, Sad. it is very dirty. Yep. It is very dirty. It's on tail. Yep. Uh, but the, the pros to it, though, is it's easily available. You can buy charcoal anywhere. And you get consistent heat. Like we're talking about the Dutch ovens or earlier, the recipe books for Dutch ovens say use X number of charcoal briquettes on top X number on bottom. So they know what the, the like the BTU per charcoal briquette is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now that we've uh, kind of, Gone off the yeah. rails with charcoal. I just want everybody to know that I'm not really part of your guys' weird racial stuff. Like, you just invited me here. I'm not even friends with all of these guys. Like, some of them I've never even met. So, just I want everybody to yeah. not part of that. Yeah, that yeah. came up definitely really wrong. Uh, yeah. The other downside of <laughs> the other downside of charcoal, it kind of like if you want to stop and make lunch, a little mm -hmm. tough in that regard. Yeah. You know what I mean? But you can wait for it. If you're cooking over charcoal, I mean, out of all of these, I think you're probably getting the best flavor maybe out of charcoal. With ex well, maybe wood if you're good at it. The other thing is uh, don't get the match light if you're just going to put it in your rig and leave it there because it tends to stink up your rig. Off gassing, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, – we're, we're running long here, so let's real quick talk about our favorite – meals to make it camp ben why don't you go first all right so so my go ahead Jeremy. i wouldn't go into the uh into the recipe i would okay just yeah kind of describe it all and right so the recipe so, will be posted in the uh in the show notes though so i like making crepes they're really simple they're fun it's like four ingredients or five ingredients something like that but I mean, the really cool thing with them is it can be really fun with like kids and stuff because you throw a little whipped cream on there, some chocolate sauce. Uh, you can do like Nutella. You could throw some breakfast cereal on there or some peanut butter or something. You can go whatever, however you want to make them. Um, there's like little restaurants now in the malls I've seen in the last couple of years that, where they have crepe, crepe places and they wrap it up like a cone. Something fun. Nice. And uh, what about you, Koi? Well, I actually really love roasting Ben. <laughs> roasting Ben. Did you really let's, go let's... to my house? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> man, that is that is harsh. Yeah, you did. He, he went to my house. I did. I was thinking he about did. running up and taking a selfie in front of your forerunner. And then stuffing oh. all the trash out of my vehicle inside of it, but I didn't know if anybody's home to all the beat up. No, <laughs> I didn't know if like, your neighbors would think something's weird going on if I'm like out on top of your truck doing weird stuff. Well, the, probably the not. Thing is probably you not. Gone up to my front door and like rang the doorbell. I've got like a, not a ring cam, but a digital one, and it was, like sent me a picture oh, of you. The wish version app. of the ring cam. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah. With it, Jeez, the that, that is some hardcore trolling man i i appreciate it I, to, I do that is some love man yeah it's uh you know it was a group effort so my, one of my favorite uh little camping recipes is called campfire apple pie you just peel and core an apple you can kind of cut it into a fan or spiral cut it and you butter up some tin foil, throw that apple on there, dump a liberal amount of cinnamon sh and sugar on it, ball that tin foil up, and just start rolling it around the coals. And uh, once you, you know, feel like you've got it, it's it's apple pie filling. It's delicious. Still can't believe you came to my house. <laughs> my gps actually shot me down <laughs> like i was almost dry i was barely out of my way it's like eight minutes out of my way i had to do it oh jeez, that's great and I, well, I have no idea who he got your address from yeah i, uh, <laughs> I, I can only guess 
Well, Aaron, what about you, man? Well, what I wrote down was uh, Jeremy's food. That's what I enjoy uh, cooking at camp the most is what Jeremy makes. <laughs> I'm not big on uh, cooking stuff at camp. I usually, what I usually buy is uh, snack food that I can just kind of snack on the whole time for whatever event that I'm going to, or I'll have some MREs or some freeze dried stuff or cereal. Um, I don't, uh, I don't really go all out. Um, I will say though, that from time to time, I do enjoy like the foil packet meals that people do where you take like a half a pound of hamburger and cut up some potatoes and mm. some people put vegetables in them. Um, I yeah. usually just stop at those two. I usually stop at just those two things, throw some seasoning on there, wrap it up in foil and put it in the coals and then just wait for it to start steaming and bubbling and just, just have some meat and potatoes. That's always a, a good hearty meal. How about you, Jeremy? So this one I haven't made yet, but I've been doing a lot of. Uh, <laughs> but it's his favorite. Well, I've been doing a lot of researching uh, for our next trip, even though we don't have one currently planned for all of us. But I'm already prep here. I'm already prepping the uh, meal plan. For well, we it. do. You just decided not to go. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a choice of words, but anyway. Uh. Um, so the next, the next trip, I'm already planning out the meals and, uh, this one I'm pretty excited about. So it's going to be a, uh, a carne asada torta with, uh, fire roasted salsa. Um, and hopefully Coyle will be there so he can bring his, uh, his blender so I can use his blender to make that, uh, that salsa. So it's just going to have like, uh, it's going to be a habanero fire roasted salsa. So you roast up all the vegetables and then put them in the blender and then, uh, and then blend them up. Um, yeah, so I'm pretty stoked about that one. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, I thought about this earlier, and I forgot to bring it up. I'll bring it up real quick when we were talking about, like, manifold burritos. I'm, I don't know this 100%, but I think that it's kind of a common cooking method in Australia. They've got little, like, 12-volt heaters uh, that, they, that they bolt underneath the dash of their vehicle. And they'll they'll like slide food into it or slide a burrito into it, and it uh, slowly cooks it while they're driving as well. Um, yes, like an uh, in in dash oven. Yes. So I, uh, other Aaron has one of those. Um, oh, does he? And, yeah. The, apparently, they take a while. So like, he'll throw a frozen burrito in there like at nine o'clock in the morning. It'll he'll eat it for lunch. That Whoa. Might be that. So that takes, takes some planning ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it but does. I mean, if you're wheeling it, once again, it's not something you're doing at camp because I think you're going to have a flat battery. If you tried to cook a burrito for three hours. Almost definitely. I, don't know. I don't know about you guys, but when I bring a lunch to work, I usually have ate all of it by nine 30. So <laughs> I would just end up eating a frozen burrito an hour and a half later. And I'm not even going to put myself through that. Right. You're like, Oh, it's not even, it's not frozen anymore. It's soft enough for me to chew with my teeth. I think it's good. I'll eat it now. Ooh, crunchy. Wait, did the package <laughs> stay fully cooked? Yeah, we're good. <laughs> yeah, it's pre-cooked. You don't have to worry about getting uh, food poisoning. Yeah, totally. Well, uh, we want to thank everybody once again for staying with us this long. Um, we don't care about running over on this podcast because we know you guys enjoy the banter and um if it's too long, I'm sure you'd write into us and tell us, but uh, we haven't heard from anybody yet. So appreciate you guys hanging out with us this whole time, watching on Facebook, watching on YouTube, um, watching through the Overland Radio uh, Facebook page and stuff like that. So really appreciate you guys. Make sure you're reaching out to your buddies and telling them about us and uh, helping us grow our show. We really appreciate you guys and God bless America. Don't forget to visit Patriot Patch and join the Patch of the Month Club. Check out our Gaia affiliate link for up to 40% off. Also, don't forget to head over to Warren and Power Tank to see all of their great gear. We are a proud part of the Firearms Radio Network. Got a question or comment? Send it to us through our webpage at firearmsradio.tv or through our social media channels by searching for Pop Road Podcast. Also, you can listen to us live at overlandradio.com Mondays at 7 p.m. Pacific. 
When off-road, please remember to have fun, tread lightly, be safe and courteous, and thanks for listening. I still can't believe you went to my house and didn't say anything. That was the whole point. <laughs> At a, at a certain point, I had to stick with it. I actually felt a little bad, but I had to follow through. That's good. That's good.